happy little games. Hello my friends and thanks for coming on back to check out volume 2 of the arcade conversions. There are some well done conversions in this one and we've also got some not so well done. But I will let you be the judge. I will say this. If you're lacking a little queef in your diet then sit back, relax and free your mind. These are the Arcade Conversions, Volume 2. The first one we are looking at is the MS-DOS version. Coming at you in either 4 or 16 spectacular colors, the game is a scrolling herky-jerky mess. While the sprites are a decent size, the animation leaves a lot to be desired. Along with the most basic of graphics and animation, you get sound via the internal PC speaker which sounds absolutely terrible. The controls of the game are too bad if you can get past the rest of the poor presentation. The Spectrum port is up next and upon first glance it doesn't look that good. Once you start to play it though you'll realize that looks aren't everything which is what all of my previous girlfriends have told me. Now even though there is a definite lack of consistent color going on, the sprites are large and resemble the arcade game. The speed of the game is pretty much consistent with the arcade original. The only time the speed tends to slow down is when you are jumping up or down between sections of a level. The way your body is twisted, it looks like you are passing gas as you are floating up or down. There is a nice rendition of the arcade theme while you play along with basic sound effects. You only have one fire button so a separate key has to be assigned to jump between sections of a level. This is a really good conversion especially considering the limited 8-bit hardware. The Amstrad version is up next and it's a pretty good attempt. The colors are nice and vibrant and the sprites are large and somewhat detailed. Not only do you get music while you play, but there is also some digitized speech sprinkled throughout. Despite only having one fire button, the controls are nice. The only downside I could find was that due to the height of the platform, it makes it difficult to see the enemies that are up there. Otherwise, it's a pretty good conversion. The good old Commodore 64 version is up next and right from the get-go it received high praise in the reviews. While the sprites are large, they are not very detailed. The colors are also dark and murky which unfortunately hurts the overall presentation. The animation and scrolling though is silky smooth. The gameplay is fast and very close to the arcade original. There is also an excellent tune that plays in the title screen and it sounds great. There is no music during gameplay but we do get nice sound effects. Once again we only have one fire button so sacrifices had to be made. It's an excellent conversion despite the control issue. Coming up next is the Sega Master System port and it's really good. The first thing you notice at the top of the screen is a health bar so now you are allowed up to three hits before you die. This was added for all the pansies out there who couldn't handle the one hit death, and I include myself in that group. This makes the game so much easier. Another change to the game is that you don't have to rescue every hostage before you proceed to the next level. However, if you don't then you can't partake in the bonus levels. While the sprites are not as large as other versions, they are nicely drawn with fairly smooth animation and scrolling. A nice rendition of the music plays in the background and it sounds pretty good. This time around we have two fire buttons which greatly enhances the gameplay and makes it feel more like the arcade game. Overall though, this is an excellent version for Sega's 8-bit hardware. And 
now we come to a bit of an oddity. A Sega Arcade Classic on a Nintendo system? Who would have thunk it? Thanks to the masterminds at Tengen, we have Shinobi running on 8-bit Nintendo hardware. Rather than port the actual arcade game, for some strange reason they decided to port the Sega Master System version instead. This includes the life bar as well as not having to rescue all of the hostages. Unfortunately, this is an inferior port to the SMS version. While the colors are not as dark as the Commodore port, they are not quite as vibrant as the Sega version. The sprites appear to have been shrunk down in size and have lost some of their detail. The sound effects and music are also subpar. The controls are okay, especially considering we have two buttons on the NES controller. This was more of a curiosity than anything else. The Atari ST version is the first of the 16-bit ports we are going to look at. While the sprites are large and detailed, the colors are very muddy. Once again, we only have one fire button which greatly hinders the gameplay. The speed of the game is also a bit of an issue, running at about 75% of the arcade game. The scrolling is also very choppy. We do have music while you play, but unfortunately the tunes don't sound that great. We do get a little bit of sample speech from the arcade game. The conversion overall is only average at best. Next up is the Amiga version, and it's a big improvement over the Atari ST. The speed of the game is just a little bit faster, but unfortunately the scrolling is still a bit too choppy. It is better than the Atari ST, but not anywhere near as smooth as other versions. Another improvement is the inclusion of parallax scrolling in the background. We get more sample speech and excellent music that plays while you play. The gameplay is good even with only one fire button. When I first got this game from my Amiga back in the day, I was always curious what the bosses would look like, especially considering the computer was a graphical powerhouse. Unfortunately, it appears they have been shrunk down, especially the first boss. Overall though, this is an excellent conversion. I just wish the scrolling was a tad bit smoother. Up next is the PC Engine version and is fantastic despite a few shortcomings. Developer Asmic did an excellent job and should be commended. The graphics look very close to the arcade game with silky smooth gameplay and animation. The speed of the game is on par with the arcade original and looks and feels great. There is also music while we play and it sounds fantastic. The only downside is that there are no more short range attacks and no time limit. They also removed the bonus stages as well as level 2 entirely. The controls feel great and we have two buttons to use this time around. Check it out if you are a fan of Shinobi and are curious what the PC Engine can do. And finally, we come to the last conversion on our list, which is the MSX version. Now, if you had an appreciation and a sense of love for the Spectrum port, but felt it was just way too fast, then this is the game for you. This is straight up a Spectrum port, and it's about as slow as a queef on a Sunday. The animation and scrolling is extremely choppy. You get only a few sound effects throughout the entire game. Once again, there is only one fire button, so sacrifices were made. I always try to find something positive to say in all of these conversions, so let me think about that. Well, at least it comes in a nice case. The first port we are looking at is the Spectrum version. The graphics are nice and detailed, with a fair amount of color sprinkled throughout. There is very little color clash, which is always a good thing. According to the original programmer, Anthony Hartley, 
Tecmo supplied them with an actual arcade unit and the source code for the game. This would explain why the graphics looked as close to the arcade game as they did. Due to memory constraints, a lot of the enemies are missing along with the gorgeous backgrounds. The speed of the game is very close to the arcade original and the playability is pretty good despite only having one fire button. The abstract version was also programmed by Anthony Hartley and it looks pretty good. Apparently the game now takes place on the moon because when your player jumps, he is in the air for about 45 seconds. The sprites are nice and detailed with excellent use of color. We also have music from the arcade game which sounds really good. The gameplay is good but the overall speed lets it down. The game runs at about 80% of the arcade original. The trusty but perhaps rusty Commodore 64 version is up next. Unfortunately, it's only average at best. The speed of the game is way too fast, sometimes a bit too fast, with lots of enemies on screen at once. Once again, we only have one fire button to use against the onslaught of enemies, so the controls do take a bit of getting used to. The graphics are varied and detailed, but the colors are extremely muddy. Also missing are the gorgeous backgrounds. The music, unfortunately, is not that memorable. I've come to expect much more from the beloved SID chip. It does play pretty well, but it's very difficult. The Sega Master System is a decent conversion, although it is stripped down from the arcade original. This was only released in Japan under the name Argus no Jujikin. Thankfully, we get two fire buttons this time around, which makes the controls much more manageable. This is more of a direct port of the arcade unit, unlike the NES version which I will talk about later in this video. Instead of 27 short stages, the game has been streamlined into 5 long stages. The headstones are missing but are replaced by flying bonuses. The graphics are detailed with colorful sprites but a lot of the backgrounds are missing. Sound effects and music are pretty good and reminiscent of the arcade game. The gameplay feels like Rygar, although it can get a bit irritating at times due to the collision detection. The best home port that was released here in the States is the Atari Lynx version. This is a straight up faithful conversion of the arcade game despite only having 23 levels. The graphics are large and detailed which is a bit of a hindrance on the small screen. The viewpoint is zoomed in making it difficult to see where your enemies are at. Finally we have nice detailed backgrounds and excellent use of parallax scrolling. The controls are nice and responsive and thanks to the two buttons found on the Atari Lynx handheld, the playability is great. The sound effects and music are really good with a nice rendition of the arcade theme. Also, for the first time in any version of the game, the statues wearing thongs make an appearance. That right there gives this version a big thumbs up. The NES version is what most retro gamers are familiar with. It was developed by Tecmo and is basically a completely different game. Instead of a straightforward side-scrolling action game, this is a more open-ended action adventure similar to Metroid. The further into the game you progress, the more of the world opens up for you to explore. There are various weapon power-ups to obtain similar to the arcade game. The graphics resemble the arcade game as does the sound. Even though this is a mixture of action and RPG, there are no save states nor a password feature. 
so if you want to beat the game, you'll have to do it all in one sitting. I would have preferred a straight up conversion of the coin op myself, but I still enjoyed playing this version. One thing of interest is that there is a bug in the PAL version. This substantially increases the difficulty of the last couple of levels. Not to the point where it's completely unbeatable, but it is much more difficult. The X68000 version is almost identical to the arcade original. This is without a doubt the best home version of Rygar. The graphics are nicely detailed with the same silky smooth parallax scrolling. The sound effects and music are excellent and seems as if they were ripped straight from the arcade original. The controls are nice and responsive and feels like Rygar. There is even an option in the menu to increase your number of lives and also the number of continues. Another stellar conversion for the X68000. The first version we are looking at today is the Atari 2600 port and upon first glance it looks okay. If you close your left eye slightly and hop on your right foot. The basics are here, meaning we have seven or eight straight vines and a few platforms to jump on. The trap jaw enemies are the size of baby scorpions and there is absolutely no fruit to collect. When Junior is climbing up and down the vines, I can't tell if he is rocking out to the latest Fozzie album or having a seizure. The music and sound effects are adequate at first, although after five minutes they started to bore a hole into my head. There are also no introductory or end level cutscenes. On a positive note, the controls are okay and there are three stages this time around instead of only two as found in the original Donkey Kong for the 2600. Moving on up in quality just a tad bit, let's take a look at the Intellivision version. Right off the bat, you'll notice that the graphics have been given a significant upgrade and look much closer to the arcade original. Except that Junior is now an albino and Mario looks like he's been on an eggplant diet for the last five months. How about those sound effects? Holy moly, I've got one thing to say, farts and queefs a mundo. There is also a definite lag in the controls when trying to perform certain moves. It's not much, but it's there. The absolutely horrible disc controller that the Intellivision uses doesn't help matters either. You also can no longer fall off the vine onto a platform but have to be lined up perfectly, which is very annoying. Speaking of the vines, we do have lovely fruit this time around to drop on the heads of your enemies who actually look like the arcade version. Similar to the 2600 port, there are three stages this time around instead of two as found in the original. The ColecoVision port is up next and for its time it was one of the best on the market. It's by no means perfect as it's missing most of the cutscenes and the graphic detail has been shrunk down considerably, but overall it's easily recognizable as Donkey Kong Jr. The fruit and enemy sprites are only one color but overall they look really good. The Donkey Kong sprite looks pretty good but it appears he's either having a siesta or Mario drugged him. The sound effects and music are not too bad and the controls are nice and responsive. Let's stick with the Coleco line and talk about the Coleco Atom version which came on the DDP cassette. Thanks to the extra storage space on the DDP, 
all of the cutscenes have been included as well as a nice arcade accurate title screen. All four of the stages have been included this time around and there are even certain prototypes floating around the internet that include an extra brand new fifth stage which I believe is Mario's Bakery. The reason this is not included was that Nintendo did not give Coleco the authorization to further add new content to the game, so they had to release it without it. Thankfully it was released and here we are 37 years later and we are able to play it on our favorite emulator. The Atari 8-bit computer version is up next and it looks fantastic. The sprites are very close to the arcade game minus some loss in color. The gameplay is not as smooth as other versions but overall it's not too bad. The game has all four stages and even some of the cutscenes made it over. The ending of the chain stage is intact with Mario getting the boots although it is a little bit different from the arcade game. The sound is really good with faithful renditions of the arcade tunes. The controls are nice and tight although the difficulty seems to have been ramped up just a bit from the arcade original. The Atari 7800 version looks very good. Not only do the sprites match the arcade game, but the colors are very close as well. The only downside is that a lot of the cutscenes are missing including the opening introduction. Mario pushing away Donkey Kong after you activate the key on each stage and the final animation of Donkey Kong falling and Junior catching him. In this version, Mario just straight up and dies without even getting a big boot from the Big Mac Daddy. Thankfully we get all four stages which is a definite plus. The sound effects and music are absolutely horrible and without even thinking twice about it, I would prefer farts and queefs over this abomination. It's almost like looking at a Picasso while having Justin Bieber blaring in your ear. It just doesn't fit. The controls are very good and it feels like Donkey Kong Jr. The NES conversion is the one most people are probably familiar with and graphically it is almost identical to the arcade game. The sprites are large and detailed and the animation is absolutely perfect. The sound effects and music are spot on and they sound great. We get all four stages but unfortunately most of the cutscenes are missing including at the end of the chain stage. Where similar to the 7800 version, Donkey Kong falls with Junior catching him and Mario just dies without even smelling Donkey Kong's big foot. Control wise it's really good and plays exactly like the arcade game. Now usually I don't talk about homebrew content on the channel. But one that was recently released was Donkey Kong Jr. for the Commodore 64 which never had a conversion. The graphics have been recreated from scratch with hints taken from the original arcade game in the NES version. They look fantastic with only a slight loss of color over the arcade original. The animation and gameplay is smooth like butter. The sound effects and music have also been recreated to take full advantage of the SID chip and they sound great. All four stages are included but some of the cutscenes are missing. Overall though, this is a fantastic conversion and it's just too bad this was not released back in the day.
Let's start off with the 16-bit Amiga version. The graphics look fantastic and they should as they were ripped straight from the arcade board. If we were judging these versions based on still images alone, the Amiga version would win hands down. The problem is, when the game starts to move, things fall apart quicker than a bootleg toy from Mexico. The scrolling, while adequate, is not very smooth and the speed of the game is not quite 100% when compared to the arcade original. The game also has a large ugly status box which takes up one third of the screen. I'm assuming this was done to keep the frame rate high but even this doesn't do the trick. The music is very good though and one of the highlights of this conversion. When I got this game as a kid I thought it was really good but looking back it's only average. It does include all eight levels in the entire arcade presentation. The game does play pretty well even with only having one fire button. Let's go ahead and look at the other 16-bit conversion which is the Atari ST version. This version as well had the arcade graphics ripped straight from the board and it transferred over quite nicely with just a slight loss of color compared to the Amiga. The game is slightly faster but unfortunately the scrolling is not. However, on the motorcycle level we do get some nice parallax scrolling that was missing from the Amiga version. There is music but unfortunately nowhere near as good as the Amiga. Content wise, this is essentially identical to the Amiga. The playability is really good. Let's move it on down to the 8-bit Amstrad version. This is a good conversion if you don't mind playing without sound. The graphics are excellent with nice animation and excellent color. The speed of the game is very good and the scrolling is decent although not quite as smooth as the Commodore 64. Content wise, everything from the arcade game is here including the introductory and in-between level sequences. The gameplay is nice, although a bit iffy on the collision detection. The Spectrum port is up next, and while it may be lacking in color, the overall detail of the game is great. The sprites are detailed and easily recognizable, and luckily enough, do not get lost in the background. The animation is fairly smooth and the speed of the game is about 90% of the arcade original. The gameplay is nice and responsive whether you are playing with the keyboard or joystick. There is a nice intro tune but during the game there is no sound. And finally we come to the cream of the crop, the Commodore 64 version. This actually feels like you are playing the arcade game although everything has been shrunk down just a bit. The sprites are a bit chunky when compared to the other versions, but the smooth scrolling and nice tight controls more than make up for it. Check out the parallax scrolling on the motorcycle level and especially the scuba diving level and you'll see what I mean. This version also gets rid of the giant status bar at the bottom of the screen. The music was done by Jeff Fallon and sounds great. This is an absolute fantastic conversion and the programmer should be commended. After these messages will be right back. They love it on Nebula. They're wild about it on Torinus. Even on Motus, where they don't like anything at all, they eat it up. It's Atari's Moon Patrol, the action-packed video game. Brace your moon buggy over enormous craters. Blast attacking saucers. And zap moon rocks. 
But you'd better watch out. Play Moon Patrol. It's more fun than a barrel of grown mix. You from Atari. The first conversion of Moon Patrol we are looking at is the Atari 2600 version. A lot of these old conversions were done by Atari themselves under their Atari Soft label. Upon first glance, this is reminiscent of the arcade original. They even managed to slip in some nice parallax scrolling backgrounds. The only problem graphically I can see is that your car looks like a beetle crawling on the ground. The sound effects and music are good with a nice rendition of the arcade jingle playing in the background. If the sound effects and music are not to your liking, you can adjust the switches to disable the sound to make it really feel like you are on the moon. How does it play? Considering there's only one fire button, it still plays fantastic. Next up is the Apple II version. While the little system tries its hardest, it just can't get the job done. Let's start off by talking about the sound and music, if you can call it that. I think there's a version of the background music playing, but it's just too hard for me to tell. The sound effects are extremely annoying with a loud whistle every time you fire. As you can see, the graphics are absolutely terrible. The colors are horrible and there are lots of flicker on your moon buggy. The speed of the gameplay is also just a bit too slow, but at least they implemented parallax scrolling. The Commodore VIC-20 is up next and I really wish it wasn't. The graphics are large and blocky with very little animation. The backgrounds are sparse making it seem like you are in the negative zone. The music is okay but the sound your buggy makes reminds me of a choo-choo train chugging along. The speed of the game tends to slow down when there is a lot of action on the screen. No sir, I would not recommend this version. The Atari 5200 version is really well done. The first thing you notice on this conversion are the excellent graphics. The parallax rolling has been replicated and looks great. What doesn't look great is the actual moon buggy itself. For one, it only has four wheels instead of six. It also has what looks like a giant drill sticking out of the front of it. The sound effects and music are very good with the same catchy theme playing in the background. Despite the horrible controllers, the game does play very well. The Atari 800 version is almost identical to this one. Well, I thought we had scraped the bottom of the barrel with the VIC-20 version, but apparently not. If you would love to play a game with just green and orange colors, then this is your lucky day. Because this is an early MS-DOS game, we are treated to some fantastic CGA 4 color graphics. But it doesn't end there. Your moon buggy looks like it was drawn by a 5 year old. There is also a whole lot of flicker going on. The sound effects are full of bloops and bleeps and farts and queefs and they sound just atrocious. There is a version of the theme song playing in the background but it's so bad I shouldn't even mention it. I guess the gameplay is okay and the speed is fairly consistent with the arcade original.
And now for something really special with the Spectrum version. If you are lucky enough to play this version, it will be like you're watching the original moon landing back in 1969 and all its black and white slow and jerky glory. I've seen and played some slow games in my day, but this has got to take the cake. The last time I had this much fun, I was at a funeral. The colors are terrible with your buggy being all black. The speed of the game is about negative 5% of the original. There is a primitive version of the arcade jingle, but that's not saying much. Okay, Batman, is there anything positive about this game? Why, absolutely there is. It was never officially released. Despite the game being completed, Atari Soft were withdrawing from the software market and this was one of the games that was left on the table. It was found and released online a few years ago. The Commodore 64 version looks really good. The animation is nice and smooth with excellent use of parallax rolling. The sprites are large and detailed with some nice animation especially on the wheels of your moon buggy. The city backdrop is missing for some reason but what's there looks really good. The sound effects are nice and the music is really good thanks to the Commodore 64 SID chip. The speed of the game is just as fast as the arcade original. Despite only having one fire button, the gameplay is top notch. Moving right along, we come to the MSX version. In still shots, it doesn't look too bad. Yes, there is a definite lack of color going on, making everything appear as if you are in the North Pole, but everything is nicely detailed. Once the game starts to move, you'll see the problem. Everything is slow and choppy. The last time I saw something this choppy, I was watching a Ginsu knife commercial. The speed is not as bad as the Spectrum version, but the jittery scrolling is absolutely terrible. We do get a decent rendition of the arcade theme and sound effects. At least the playability sort of makes up for it. The Texas Instruments version looks good, although the screen is a bit cramped. I don't know if this is because they put your scoring information at the bottom, but something just feels a bit off. The sprites are large, but they are a bit blocky and don't have the greatest amount of detail. The speed of the gameplay, while smooth, is not quite up to the arcade original. We have music and sound effects while we play, but the quality is not very good. The ColecoVision port is another game that was completed but did not ship out due to Atari Soft closing down. It's a shame this was never released back in the day because it's an excellent conversion despite a few odd design choices. Matthew Householder, who was the programmer of the cartridge, did not like the look of the background so he redesigned them to his liking. There is a great rendition of the theme song as well as excellent sound effects. The controls are fantastic and despite only having one fire button it feels like the arcade game. In 2014, he made some graphical changes and manufactured a few copies of the game for fans.
Up next is the Atari ST version and it looks very close to the arcade game. Nice, vibrant colors along with large, detailed sprites makes this one of the better Atari ST arcade conversions. The scrolling and animation are very smooth, especially the backgrounds. The music and sound effects are pretty good, although they could be better in my opinion. Playability-wise, it feels good just like the arcade game. Even the Game Boy Color received a version of Moon Patrol. The game was released as part of a two-pack under the Midway Presents Arcade Hits along with Spy Hunter. While the game is not arcade perfect, it's very close and does a really good job of replicating the arcade machine on the humble Game Boy Color. Sprites are nice and detailed and the animation is very smooth. The sound effects and music are only average at best, but they do get the job done. We finally have separate buttons for jumping and firing, so we are able to play it just like in the arcade. Speed to the game is very fast and feels just like the original. In the year 2000, Midway's Greatest Arcade Hits Volume 2 was released. This was a compilation of various arcade games and among them was a pixel perfect version of Moon Patrol. The game was running under emulation so what you are getting is essentially the arcade game at home in terms of graphics, sounds and playability. It was released for a multitude of platforms. Let's check out the Spectrum version first. Aside from a few quirks, this is a really well done version on the primitive hardware. Everything from the arcade game appears to be here including the glorious boss fights. The graphics and animation are well done and there is very little color clash which really helps the overall gaming experience. The speed of the game is consistent with the arcade game but there is one problem. At certain points when you fire a bullet, your player runs so fast that he can sometimes outrun the bullet. Don't know if he either dropped about 5 Red Bulls or just did a little bit of crack before he started playing, but it does seem just a little bit odd. Now it was my understanding that the early MS-DOS computers had an exclusive agreement on all farts and queefs in video games, but apparently that's just not the case. Bloops and bleeps and farts and queefs are what we get when it comes to the sound. To be honest, any sort of sound coming out of this machine is a welcome addition so I guess I can't complain too much. They do their job and is better than sitting in silence, unless you're married. The controls work out pretty well and there is a simultaneous two player option as well. The Amiga version is up next and at the time it was the best home conversion of this glorious arcade game. Although it's definitely not arcade perfect, the graphics do a great job of representing the original. The sprites are colorful and well defined and the animation is nice and smooth. The entire arcade presentation is included as well as simultaneous two player action. The gameplay is fast and furious but sometimes there is a problem with the scrolling. At times it seems to scroll fine, other times not so much. The sound effects and music are spot on with all of the voice samples from the arcade game included and are crystal clear. One of the problems that rears its ugly head is that there are only 4 levels instead of 6. I don't know if the developers ran out of time but it's a shame to see an otherwise good conversion drop a few notches because of this. Overall though, it's a really good conversion especially back in 1989.
Now let's take a look at the Amstrad version. Oh boy, where do I begin? Let's start with the positive, and yes, that was singular. There is pretty good music and sound effects while you play. Okay, now let's take a look at everything else. The gameplay is extremely slow and the animation looks like a bootleg cartoon from 1950s Russia. If you've ever played a video game and thought, wow, the scrolling is way too smooth for my blood, then this is the game for you. I've seen a lot of choppy scrolling in my life, but this one has to take the cake. Now I have to give the developers some credit for doing what they could do on this tiny little machine, but it just doesn't work. A lot of times your character and also the enemy bullets will blend into the background making it impossible to see. There are also only four levels with the mini bosses at the end of each one. The hitboxes on the characters are also way too big putting a perfect bow on the entire package. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, the MSX version rears its ugly head. This looks to be a port of the Spectrum version but running far worse and looking far uglier. The scrolling and animation appears to run at about 2 frames per second throwing the frantic gameplay out the window. Enemies will appear and you will have plenty of time to blow them to smithereens. The gameplay speed is laughable and I don't know how a game got released in this state. The sound effects are your basic bloops and bleeps with absolutely no music. This looks like it was coded by my 5 year old niece just after nap time at daycare. If the name of your game is pain then this is the game for you. The Atari SC version is very similar to the Amiga version. The same scrolling issues apply but overall it's still a good port. The ST version does have a reduced color palette and the quality of the music is not up to par either. All of the voice samples have been included but not quite as clear as the Amiga. The same frantic gameplay is still present making for an overall good conversion. The good old Commodore 64 version is up next and it's absolutely the best 8-bit port. While the sprites are not quite as detailed, the developers did manage to capture the Alien Syndrome feel. The scrolling is silky smooth along with the character animations. We even get some nice parallax scrolling on certain levels. The SID chip is put to good use with fantastic music and excellent sound effects. All of the content is here including the opening title animation in all six worlds and bosses. There is a bit of slowdown at times but overall it doesn't hurt the gameplay experience. As I mentioned, developers managed to replicate the arcade's feel, so it literally feels like you are playing the arcade game. There is even a two player co-op mode available. This is a fantastic conversion and well worth a spot in your Commodore 64 library. The version most people are probably familiar with is the NES version. This was an unlicensed cartridge by Tengen, but don't let that sway you, this is a really good version of Alien Syndrome. While it does attempt to replicate the arcade layout, it does add some cinemas in game which helps flesh out the story. The graphics and animation are nice, although the color choices are a bit odd in my opinion. 
The scrolling is smooth, although not quite as smooth as the Commodore 64 version. The gameplay speed also seems to be just a tad below the arcade original. The music and sound effects are adequate, although they can't touch the Commodore 64 in terms of quality. Thankfully, a simultaneous two-player option has been included as well. There are also continues available to help you on your quest. This is another fine conversion which does a good job at replicating the arcade original. Sticking with the 8-bit systems, the Master System is up next. The graphics are nicely detailed and the colors are a bit of a step up from the NES version. The animation is nice and smooth and the gameplay flows nicely, easily replicating the arcade game. Any fan of the original arcade game will notice right off the bat that the map layouts are totally different. Also, the game no longer scrolls but uses a flick screen scroll instead. This doesn't hurt the gameplay too much, but it doesn't feel arcade authentic either. There is no music in the background, but you do get decent sound effects while you play. Most of the levels have been included as well as the bosses, although some of those have been changed as well. The game is also extremely difficult, so put on your big boy pants when you play this version. It plays pretty good, although I wish the arcade layout had been included. Surprisingly, the Game Gear version is not just a straight up port of the Master System version. This one gives you an animated opening explaining what's going on. We also have scrolling gameplay just like in the arcade original, although the map layout is entirely different. While the viewpoint is zoomed in just a little bit, making for a somewhat cramped feel, the sprites are nicely detailed and are animated perfectly. The gameplay offers some other differences, including the map now being visible at any time, as well as stackable weapons. You also have the ability to upgrade your weapons, such as a flamethrower having a longer reach, and fireballs having a homing option. The differences aren't just in the map layouts and the weapons, but there are a variety of new enemy types as well. The music and sound effects are really good and make good use of the Game Gear's audio chip. The controls feel nice and tight with fast gameplay. There is no simultaneous two-player option, but other than that, this is another really good conversion of the arcade game. The MS-DOS version is up next, and for a 1989 conversion, it's not too bad. The game looks very similar to the Amiga version, although the colors seem to be not quite as sharp. The speed of the game is very consistent, although the scrolling is a bit too choppy, although nowhere near as bad as some of the 8-bit versions. We do have Sound Blaster support, so there is nary a fart or queef to be found. The sound effects and what little music we have sound pretty good, and it even includes the digitized speech from the arcade game. The gameplay is good with nice responsive controls. All six levels are present as well as two-player co-op. Another good conversion of this classic Sega arcade game. In 1992, the absolute best home conversion at the time was released for the X68000. This was programmed by Dempa, and it shows because this is virtually arcade perfect. 
everything from the graphics to the animation to the sound is fantastic. All six levels and bosses are included as well as a two player co-op. Of course the playability is spot on and this is absolutely the best arcade version at home. And that brings us to the end of Volume 2 on the Arcade Conversions. Thank you for all your comments and let me know if you want to see this series continue. The next video I do will be something entirely brand new. If you enjoyed this content or any of my content, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you all so much for watching.